Hello, we would like to give a God-blessed greeting to all of our Pleasant Green parishioners. This is for our Lesson 8 out of Unit 2. This is for January the 19th, 2020. And our lesson, continuing from Unit 2, is entitled, A Bright Future. A Bright Future. And our devotional reading is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Our background scripture is 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 2 through 53, and also 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verses 12 through 42. Our printed passage from the Faith Pathway Study Manual is 1 Kings verse uh, chapter 8 verses 22 through 30 and also verses 52 and 53 our key verse is 1 Kings 8th chapter verse 30 and I'll be reading the NIV version Hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. And our lesson's aims are, understand the importance of a national temple for Israel. Be grateful for God's faithfulness in covenant relationships. Embrace a worshipful lifestyle in life of God's continuing goodness. Now, our lesson today has three sections to it, and all of them are identified by prayer and three types of prayer. And our first section, which focuses on verses 20 through, uh, 22 through 25, is entitled, A Reflective Prayer. And then our next section, uh, verses 26 through 30, is entitled, A Receptive Prayer. And then, of course, our last section, verses 52 and 53, are entitled, A Respectful Prayer. As we uh, address these three areas in our lesson, uh, I would uh, like to uh, incite your attention in the introduction of our lesson and uh, I know it's printed in the manual but I would just like to read it uh, to somewhat uh, set the tone or to somewhat give insight into the significance of the prayers in our lesson. Uh, it speaks about a theme and how themes sometimes develop a certain uh, appearance, a certain vision, a certain purpose, or a perspective for us to focus upon and somehow create a picture or create a understanding of what 
our gathering or what our function or our purpose for this assembly is. So I would just like to read just a little bit into the introduction. And these are the words I would like for us to digest and uh, then um, you know, continue into the three different sections of our lesson. The positive thought breathes life into our churches that feeds our communities in the midst of challenges and situations that can cause one to feel hopeless. Our lessons are addressing the congregation of Israel. And as Solomon is praying, uh, Solomon is addressing uh, some needful concerns uh, as acknowledgement and then also as prerequisites, so to speak, or as safeguards. Acknowledgements and prerequisites and safeguards uh, to speak before the God of the people and to inform the people that these are the petitions that Solomon is uttering before the God of all, and then for the people to hear them to create the theme, to create the purpose, to create the focus of why when we assemble ourselves here, what then is the expectation? And so our uh, introduction says, uh, today we are faced with rising black-on-black -black violence within our communities, decreasing availability of inner-city jobs, a declining inner-city fresh food deficiencies and health care and shortages, not to leave out black victims of police and white criminal conduct and unjust and unbalanced policing and sentencing against people of color. Some suggest we have a rich history and a promising future, but a bleak presence or a bleak present. If we succumb to this mantra, in place, it places a stain and a cloud of doubt on the bright future aspect. Having hope and envisioning an exceptional future requires a strong maintenance of hope that boldly and repeatedly proclaims a bright future for all. And I thought that would be good for us to uh, reflect upon since the first section of our lesson is the reflective prayer. And in uh, the eighth chapter of Romans, the 24th and the 25th verse. It reads, For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Now we know from the 11th chapter of Hebrews that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So as we 
engage into our lesson, when we think about the closing comments of the introduction referencing hope and the significance of the hope, um, we realize that this is an urgency. This is, as the key verse of our lesson says, supplication of your servant. Uh, when one would engage in supplication to the Lord, it was a appearance. There was a form in which the petition or the prayer was delivered unto God and one would uh, be on their knees and then stretched out with their hands and face down to the earth in a outreached form to the Lord and it symbolized that there was a humbleness and a sincerity in the uttering of the prayer. And these uh, were utterances of things that they were thankful for, and at the same time, things that they were in need of. These were petitions asking God uh, to do for what they realized and recognized that they themselves could not do. It was to seek and to plead for the involvement of the Spirit of God to come in and correct and, and to transform uh, certain ills in the congregation as such as in our society today to correct and to rebuke and to act justly in the cause of humankind because now there is a realization that we are beyond uh, self-correcting. Uh, we need the presence of the Spirit of God to move in a mighty way. And so we are hoping for that which we do not see. Hoping for that which we do not see. Because scripture clearly says that why would we hope for what we already see? But in the process of us hoping for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it. But waiting for it is also connected to with perseverance. When someone perseveres something, it is not uh, understood that they are stagnant, uh, that they are somehow uh, contained in one place. It is like the unjust judge and the widow woman who was coming to seek for justice and uh, she persevered. Now, she was waiting for what she was hoping for, but in the process of her waiting to receive justice, she continued to persevere unto the unjust judge. And even though the judge rec said that he didn't fear any man, but yet he granted judgment on behalf of the widow because she persevered. So when we when we understand that hoping and waiting is not stagnant, it is being persistent. Now let us go on into our uh, lesson uh, because uh, the lesson opens up with the reflective prayer. And what happens here is, is that uh, Solomon uh, resounds in front of the congregation that the Lord God of Israel is the only God. 
that there is no other God like the God of Israel, that the God of Israel is the one who is above the heavens and the earth. It is the one who made a promise and then fulfilled God's promise. So we know that when God sets something in place, when God places or when God establishes something and then utters to us through him, God's self or either through the messenger of God, God doesn't just speak to hear himself speak. God doesn't uh, use words to flatter himself. But God speaks for purpose. And so therefore, David, I mean, that uh, Solomon is reminding the people that these are the things that the Lord spoke to my father. And he told my father that he was going to do these things. And today I stand before you to declare that the promises that have been made by God have been fulfilled. Because I am now your servant and I am now ruling in the house that God said that he would not leave, uh, that there would not be a time when there was no successor to the throne. I stand before you today to declare to you that we are in a moment of the fulfillment of God's promises. Because I am now the successor to my father on the throne of Israel. And so when we look at the reflective prayer, we look at how does God remind us, not that God needs to be reminded, but we need to be reminded of how God has fulfilled his promises to us and has never wavered or changed his mind or, or decided maybe I should do this instead of that. But as I said before, when God speaks, God doesn't speak to flatter himself. Uh, God doesn't speak to pump up his ego. God doesn't have an ego. And so therefore, when God utters, God's uttering is for fulfillment. God's uttering is for purpose. God's uttering is for us to recognize that, there, that, that God has interceded in and on our behalf. Now, when we look at the second section of our uh, lesson, uh, where it says the receptive prayer. Now, when we speak about the receptive prayer, we're, we're speaking about um, its utterance where that it, it is in a form of reception. It's being received. And so uh, when we look here uh, in our verses of 26 through 30, and we look at how Solomon is fashioning this. Now, now remember, he's uttering this in the presence of all of Israel. So as we uh, indulge into what words Solomon is actually saying here, through the earnest and sincere spirit in, in his presentation, in this supplication to God. When, when we recognize what he says here, he acknowledges that the God that he's speaking to is too large, is so vast, is so enormous, is so everywhere at the same time, is, is so uncomprehendable that he says, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. So how much less this temple I have built? 
Yet, give attention to your servant. Give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy. Lord, my God, hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence this day. Then he asks what God already does, but then he asks, and may your eyes be open toward this temple day and night, and may you uh, always uh, listen to the prayers of your people and your servants towards this place. So here he's making a earnest prayer unto God and in the presence of Israel so that they would hear what he in one way or another is making as a supplication of covenant with the Lord at the establishment of the new temple as they are dedicating the temple unto God. So he's establishing the uh, he's establishing the urgency, and also he's identifying that these are the things that we ask of you: that you would give attention unto us, that you would be merciful unto us, that as we pray unto you that you would always keep your eyes upon this temple, that you would watch over us day and night, and that you would always remind us that your name shall be here. And so what what is happening is, is that Solomon is setting a tone as we open in the beginning of our lesson and we talked about how that the theme, the purpose, the reason, the expectation of why we assemble here. So Solomon is actually declaring these things. At the same time, he's acknowledging that the place that we are assembling and gathering is not actually the place that can house the presence of God. Even though in our lesson, in our lesson beginning at the 8th chapter of 1 Kings, as we read further down into it, it talks about how there was preparation and the function of the priests uh, with the Ark of the Covenant and how they uh, began the process of dedicating the temple to God. And it spoke about how that a cloud descended upon the temple and that the cloud uh, represented the presence of the Lord to the point that the priests couldn't continue ministering They couldn't continue ministering uh, because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. And as you read in the lesson and come down uh, through verses 5, chapter uh, 8, 1 Kings verses 5 and read on down and you get a, a appearance, you get an idea of how uh, what Solomon was speaking of when he began to utter that uh, this small dwelling was not large enough uh, to fulfill the presence of the true living God, that just a heavy cloud brought about such a observation uh, it brought about such an awesome spiritual presence that just the cloud filled the temple. And so now uh, there are other passages as well. There's uh, the first verse 
in uh, Isaiah 66. And then there's also the seventh chapter of Acts, uh, which is uh, a uh, reference back to uh, the 66th chapter of Isaiah, uh, speaking of the fact uh, when Isaiah, uh, when it speaks and says, and where is the house that you have built for me? Because the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. And so, uh, and then it talks about, and then everything else, mine own hands have made. And so it, it, it speaks of the enormity of God. Now, when we acknowledge that uh, Solomon is trying to establish a relationship and agreement here in the covenant with God and with the establishing and the dedication of the temple here, then we hear that uh, going back now to verse uh, 25, uh, where he establishes here again a expectation. For he says in verse 25, towards the latter part of that verse, if only your descendants are careful in all they do, to walk before me faithfully as you have done. So Solomon here is establishing, as I've said before, some requirements. There are some expectations. There are certain uh, behaviors. There are certain conduct. Uh, there are certain way of living that if those things are followed, if, if that is the creed by which we live, then we can expect that God will bless us and that God will be with us, before us, in us, and all over us if we fulfill the will of God in our daily living. And what Solomon is pleading here and verbally saying before the congregation is upon these guidelines, upon the words that I am uttering, this is how I expect to receive the reactions from the one and true living God. It is based upon the things that we do that would actually be a reciprocal action from God that God would reward us when we God acknowledges that we are obedient, that we are in supplication to God, that we earnestly and that we sincerely seek God's guidance and God's direction and God's judgment in what we do and how we do it and why we do it, and where we do it. And so as we uh, come to the latter part of our lesson, and it is the respectful prayer, and here, um, here Solomon gives us these words. May your eyes be open to your servant's plea, and to the plea of your people Israel. And may you listen to them whenever they cry out to you. For you singled them out from all the nations of the world to be your own inheritance. Just as you declared through your servant Moses when you, sovereign Lord, brought our ancestors out of bondage, out of Egypt. So, as we reflect upon this lesson today, in the last section before the closing thought, 
There are seven petitions that Solomon prayed to God, and they were listed uh, starting at verse 31 and continuing all the way through to 53. And I would sincerely petition uh, those of us that are listening that we would read those verses to get a full understanding in your leisure. Uh, I would even, uh, I would even uh, request that, uh, or even plead that we would make it a necessity uh, to read this and then affix it to our present day. Because Solomon here is identifying uh, some actual occurrences that are even present, even though he's speaking to Israel in times uh, gone past. But Solomon is raising some concerns here about some occurrences that we are experiencing today. And it would be to our benefit for us to read those verses so that we can see and uh, so that we can hear and understand the petitions that Solomon is placing before God. And then if we would just on in, in our quiet spot, in our secret closet, uh, at our altar, if we would utter these same things, uh, as the introduction opened up and it talked about when we sincerely offer prayer to God collectively together that we somewhat we somewhat develop or we somewhat present a plea before the Lord that causes him to respond and so when it speaks about when they cry out, that that is a, a utterance of that that's a necessity. This is urgent. When they it's humbling, it's it's in spirit that is in duress. And so when they cry out to you, I hope that you will listen to them. We hope that something that was said would be of a blessing uh, and that it would also encourage us to continue to persevere, to be of good strength and to be of encouragement before because the same God that was the God of Israel is still the same God that is present today and the same God that fulfilled the promises for Israel is still available to fulfill promises to us today. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.